you know, this is the time of year when we talk about God coming here and, and the reasons that, that he had. And I'll take a little different path tonight probably than what you may think a message around Christmas is going to be about. But it'll be a little bit what uh, Pastor Dave alluded to. He didn't know, he doesn't know exactly what, you know, where this is going to go. But this is the time of year that we, as Christians, we come to celebrate the birth of Christ. Do we not? Yes. But then there's also a whole lot of uh, Santa Claus and ho, 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 and uh, Saint Nick and Elf on the Shelf and all the rest of this <laughs> stuff that, that enters in, into our lives. But it's at this time of year that many people start thinking that what this is for is what presents they're going to get. What are they going to receive? What are they going to be what are they going to be given? And they get so wrapped up in counting on a certain present. They've dropped every hint. They, they, they try to leave things laying around or their computer open to a certain page so the wife will see this. And they get so focused on that 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 want almost becomes a need. Something that they have to have. And then when they don't if they don't get it, it's like Christmas is a bit of a disappointment to them. <coughs> now I know that would only be, you know, you've all came here as babies. So I don't think there's anybody in this room that probably hasn't experienced a little of that, or is that just carnal down? <laughs> I think everybody here, if we're honest with ourselves, there's been times that we were disappointed but, you know, we also have to keep in mind that for many people, Christmas can be a very, very difficult time. These holidays can be very trying. I've heard people say, I just want to survive the holidays. Mm. Anybody else ever? I just want to survive the holidays. How sad is that? How terrible is that, that people... We're, cut, we're here now to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ coming robed in flesh to pay the price for our sin. And there are people that just want to survive the holidays. Yes. You know, but we have to understand that when we're greeting people, when we're talking to people, when we're seeing whether it's a clerk in a store or whatever it is, we don't know exactly what's going on in their lives. One of the things that I think is a tradition is a lot of people at Christmas will gather together with family or friends and they'll have dinner. Well, maybe there's going to be an empty chair this year. Someone passed away. That they're not going to be there. And so that person that seemed rude to you, their mind is in an entirely different place because they're thinking of that person that's not going to be there. You know, there's things that happen in people's lives. Things like, how about... Somebody you work with, maybe you don't know it, maybe they got divorced. Maybe they're having some problems with their, you know, with their kids. Or how about this one? They're, they're doing the whole present thing, they're going through this, they're buying presents for everybody, they're getting there, and right before Christmas they lose their job. And now the whole pressure is, how am I going to pay for this? Am I going to tell the kids, don't open that. Just take, the, just take the wrapping paper off, but don't play with the toy. We're going to take it back. You know, see, we don't know everything that somebody is going through. But I want to talk a little bit tonight about a message that I see that's, if you want to say, behind Christmas. Yes, we're celebrating Christ coming robed in flesh to pay that price for our sin. But there's a message that I think that, another message that's behind that. And the retailers out there tell us that Christmas... Christmas is to give. It's for giving. It's, it's for giving presents. It's for, you know, Madison Avenue would be the, you know, the marketers, the retailers, all these ads that we have that it's out there. And we're supposed to, we're just supposed to buy, 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 keep buying. So we go out there and we go to find that special gift that we're going to get for somebody. And you know what? Even if we can't find it, we're probably going to buy something anyway. And that's the message that they want us to swallow. They want us to, to latch on to that. 
But I'm going to tell you what I think the, the message of Christmas is. I think Chris, Christmas is forgiving. I don't mean forgiving. I mean forgiving, like forgiveness. Yeah. And we're going to explore that. We're going to go through that tonight and talk about uh, what the Bible has to say about that. But I think that's the true spirit of Christmas. And everybody here, I will guarantee you, has had to wrestle with the subject of forgiveness. And right here now, we've got what I would call, well, in my case, it might be three families. I have family here. I have remnant family. And I have morning glory family. But you know what? Families can be kind of weird. I mean, everybody's got that weird uncle or, you know, or something, you know, that, that, that's, where did he come from? Where did that, you know, and, but, so we all have that, but you know what, here at Remnant, we're a family, but we are not going to all act alike, think alike, be exactly alike, and God never wanted that for us. If God wanted that, God would have made robots. God would have made every one of us to not have independent thoughts, but to only do this. That's why he cherishes our love. Amen. Because he wants us to give that to him voluntarily. Right. He doesn't force that on us. But I was wrestling with, what am I going to speak on tonight? I was going through this, and I know Pastor David said, you know, what, what are you going to speak on? And I thought, I don't know. <laughs> so I said... All I want for Christmas. Because I thought, well, I can come up with a bunch of things with all, all I want for Christmas. I remember a song from when I was a kid, All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth. So I thought, well, I got those, so they, that's not going to work. I, I hear this song all the time, All I Want for Christmas is You. So don't take this wrong, but besides Vicky, that, you know, that's not going any further, any further than that. But... I was down in Arizona visiting family. And Corey, can you put this slide up? I was saying, God, what do I, you know, I'm not sure where I should be going. And I see this sign. It says, genuine Christians forgive like Jesus. And I had, think, had been thinking about Christmas is forgiving. Christmas is that we're supposed to be forgiving people. And I saw that and I thought, well, I guess... You know, some people, God might give them a little unction, a little nudge with me. He, he's got to do something like have a build, billboard up there. To, you know, kind of like, Don, are, are you getting it now? Are, are you understanding this? So, so you'll see us go down that path. But back to the Bible, in John 3, 16 and 17 and 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And he goes right on to that next verse, but many times people ignore that next verse. But it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through them. God didn't condemn. He did not come here to condemn. Remember, he came robed in flesh. And if anyone had the right or a reason to condemn, it would have been the Almighty God coming here robed in flesh. Yes. But that's a very important principle that you need to remember. God did not come here to condemn you. Right. He did not come here to condemn you. He loves you yes. and he wants the best for you. And that's difficult many times for people to accept. But I'm going to focus on an account in the Bible that those have been, that have been coming to uh, Wednesday night Bible study, it's, it's going to be a, a rehash of some of what they've heard, but I, there may be something, some different takes in here that you get too. But I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk tonight a lot about Joseph. Amen. You know, we've been, we went through Genesis, we're done with that, we covered Joseph's life, but so we're going to reinforce that, but... And I'll give some overviews as we go here for those that aren't familiar with the account and for those that are to, to remind you. But Joseph, Joseph's dad thought the world of him. Just doted on him, loved him. Joseph had 10 
older brothers, and he had Benjamin, one younger brother. But his life almost became a tragedy. Strictly because his bro really his brothers did not like him. So we'll pick up the story where Joseph is in his teens. And when he was in his teens, the Bible tells us teens that he was his father's favorite. And that was because he had uh, been born to him in his, old, in his dad's old age. And one of the things that he did is he gave his son, gave Joseph, a coat of many colors. Now that may be in today's world and where we live in, I'm sure I can look in here and I can see a number of coats of different colors, but it wasn't so prevalent in those days, in those ancient times of a coat of many colors, a bright coat. But so, so that was cool, that, that was great that, you know, Joseph stood out, but it angered his brothers. I mean, his dad might as well put a bullseye on his back because his brothers weren't having any, any of this. They were like, okay, you, you think so much about Joseph, what about the rest of us? But God gave Joseph a dream. And he gave him this dream of what was going to happen in Joseph's life. And Joseph felt he needed to share this. He wanted to share this with his family. So he goes to his family and he basically says, I've had this dream. And God is going to use me. God has something special planned for my life. Didn't go over well. <laughs> Did not go over well at all. His brothers were already upset about him being dad's favorite, but now he tells them this dream. And in this dream, you have to understand that this grain is bowing down. They're all bowing down to him. So his brother's are like, wait a second. Now, Junior, you're telling us that we're going to be bowing down from, to you? You're going to be ruling over us? And I don't know exactly what Joseph said, but I think Joseph probably said, I'm telling you the dream. I'm telling you what God gave me. But the brothers decide they've got to do something about this. They have to deal with this problem. They have to deal with this issue that they have. So they came up with this rather unique way of handling the problem with their brother. They said, we'll kill him. <laughs> we'll get rid of the problem. All we got to do is kill him. And one of the, uh, I think it was Reuben, the oldest brother, is really not real wild about shedding of blood. You got to remember, these brothers were brought, brought up in the faith. And uh, he didn't want to shed any blood. So they decided, okay, what we're going to do here is we're just going to take him and we'll throw him in a cistern. Big, big hole in the ground. You know, picture like a big well or something in the ground. We're going to throw him in there. Well, and the Bible talks about how they had his coat of many colors. Well, I wasn't there, but I can picture Joseph didn't just say, let me take this off and give it to you. I imagine he got abused pretty good to get that coat off. Probably got the tar beaten out of him before he was thrown into that cistern. And then they take this coat and they rip up this coat and they put animal's blood on it and show it to their dad and say, look. And dad fell for it. In his grief, he said, you know, wild animals must have killed Joseph. So that's great. Now, now they, you know, they come up with the idea that well, we got a little bit of a problem though. We still have... Joe's still out there in a, in a pit, in a cistern. We've got to do something about that. So they go hang around that pit, and Ishmaelites come coming down the road. So it's like, I think they were probably going, thank you, God. Here it is. Not only, because now we're going to get rid of them, because we know where they're headed. They're going to be headed probably to Egypt, to the slave auction, because they would see what else they had there with them. So they then decide that we're going to sell them. We can make a profit on this. We not only get rid of the rotten little brother, but we're going to make some money on this. So they sell them into slavery. And 
the slave traders take them to Egypt. And the Ishmaelites take them to an auction there. And Joseph is purchased by a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar is a pretty well-to-do man. And even though he's a slave, even though Joseph's a slave, he excels in his household. The Bible talks about God was with Joseph. So he didn't just go and say, my life stinks. He said, he knew God was with him. So he excels. He did the work of a slave in Potiphar's household, and Potiphar ends it up, it takes him as like his trusted assistant. Joseph's in charge of everything that Potiphar has. Every single thing. So things seem to be going pretty good. It's going good now. Nobody's beating him up anymore. He's out of the pit. He's in a nice house. Well, boss likes me. Problem is the boss's wife. Potiphar's wife liked him too. <laughs> and she liked him a little too much. The Bible says that she tried to seduce him. And she tried to seduce him numerous times. And finally one time, and, you know, and Joseph being a righteous man, he's not going to go along with this. There's two things there. One, that's not his wife, so he's not going to have relations with him. It's his master's wife, and it violates everything God would have him do. So Joseph's not going to go along with that situation, but the one time when he rejects Potiphar's wife, she ends up telling her husband. And the husband has Joseph arrested. So now, Joseph has went from being abused by his brothers, thrown in a cistern, taken to a foreign country, sold at an auction as a slave, and now he's thrown into prison. Well, if Joseph was that good looking, that Potiphar's wife was that interested in him. And remember, he's a teen. And now he gets thrown in a prison. I would hate to think the vile things that probably happened to that young boy in prison. I don't think, not that our prisons today are great, but I have a feeling they're probably light years ahead of you know, the way things were handled uh, back then. But Joseph is not going to be bitter. He's not going to be unforgiving. And he ends up, the Bible says that God was there with him, but it also says that he gained favor with the warden. That he was now, the warden was putting him in charge of things. So he's moving up the ladder there, and Joseph meets a couple of guys. Two guys that were, if you want to say, had been uh, tossed out of Pharaoh's inner circle. There was a baker and then a, a, a butler or a cupbearer. And they were have, both these men were having dreams, had visions, and they didn't know what they meant. And they asked, and Joseph, with God being with him, because this isn't just some special ability Joseph has, this is God working through him. Joseph says, in three days to the baker, your head's going to be lifted up. You're going to be killed. And he says the, to the cupbearer, to the uh, butler, in three days, you're going to be restored to your position. Three days go by. Baker gets killed. The butler, cupbearer, gets restored to his position. And Joseph had said, when this happens, he said, remember me. Remember me. You know, I'm the guy sitting here in prison. And if you're going to get out of here, put in a good word for me because the Pharaoh's calling you back there, get me back. Well, the Bible says that two years later, Pharaoh is having these dreams that are ripping him up, that he can't figure out what they are. And he asks all of his wise men, all the, all the uh, muckety mucks of that time, to interpret, to, to tell, let him what to know what the dream is and interpret it, and none of them can do it. And now this butler thinks and says, well, wait a second, that's right, there was that guy in prison. 
And he mentions it to Pharaoh because Pharaoh is so desperate. So they get Joseph, bring him to Pharaoh, and Joseph interprets the dream. Tells him it's about a coming famine and what that means. And really, if you want to say, I'm giving you, you know, just the gist of this stuff. You go, can all go in Genesis and read um, and, and get all the details. But the nutshell is, Joseph's life, his life changes immediately. He's made second in command of all Egypt, which was the big place to be at the time. Second in command of all Egypt. Now, that might seem like an appropriate time to Joseph say, to say, let's see, I'm second in command now, so I think, I think maybe it's time for me to have a little talk with the butler that let me rot in that prison with all those men for the last two years. Joseph doesn't do anything like that. He shows kindness. He shows forgiveness. Because for one, he understands that it's God that gave him the wisdom to interpret and to know what Egypt should do about the coming famine. Amen. And he knew any vengeance he took against that uh, butler was wrong. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Amen. It's not up to us to take vengeance. Now understand that this fam when the famine actually occurred, because there was going to be seven years of uh, harvest, of feast yet, and then seven years of famine. So by the time this happens, this is about 15 years after Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery. So 15 years have gone by. This famine now affects the whole world. Everywhere. No one has food. They have to, if they want to need grain, they're going to have to come to Egypt. Well, it affected Israel. So Joseph's family, all his brothers, come to Egypt. They come to Egypt to come before him. Because if they want to get grain, they've got to go in front of the big dog. They're not getting it from just anybody, so they have to go in front of Joseph. They have no idea. They, they, they don't know who he is, and you have to picture 15 years that went by. He's went from being a teenage, teenager from being a boy, and now he's hardened. He's been in a prison, and now he's, what, 30 or so. And he's also dressed like an Egyptian, if you've seen the way that they dress. And these men had makeup and, you know. And, but Joseph recognizes his brothers. And now Joseph's got to decide what to do. Genesis 45 and 1 says that Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Now, Joseph was a very important man now, but he could not hold it in any longer. All these years, he held all that in. So he said, he said to his brothers, you know, finally, you know, I'm your brother. I'm Joseph. I'm the one you threw in the pit. I'm the one you sold into slavery. I'm the one whose life you wrecked. And when he says that, the floodgates open. It talks about how people outside of that room, how the Egyptians could hear him wailing and crying. And I don't think they had thin walls in those days, so he must have been crying quite a bit. But there was so much pain that he had in his life because of his brother's mistreatment. But he had to let it go. He had to cry. And I'm going to tell you that I think if some of you that are here tonight, if some of you would just have the courage to deal with some of the issues and the relationship difficulties that you face, to be honest with them and face them head on, you know what? You might weep just like Joseph. But what do we do? We put on our smiles. We put on these little smiles and we go on with our life like everything's okay. I don't have a problem in the world. That's not what this church is meant for. Amen. Amen. And people awful, you know, so often hide behind a handshake, a smile, all the problems that they have. And what they're doing is they're recycling this pain. It keeps coming back to them. 
And, you know, in life there's only one thing that you can do that's going to let you break that cycle like Joseph did. If anybody had a reason to, for, to not forgive, yeah. Right. Yeah. Joseph just spent over half his life in prison and slavery right. because of these ten brothers. Yeah. Yeah. But Joseph didn't do that. He was forgiving. Joseph wasn't the bad guy here. He was the victim. He was an innocent victim. He had just told his brothers about the plan that God had for his life. That, that, that's all he had done. Said, you know, someday God's going to use me. But just because of their jealousy, because of their not liking that he was dad's favorite, they did all these things to him. And here's what Jesus says about that in Luke 6, 27 and 28. It says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Yes. Everybody here has had someone that's hurt them. Amen. We have all had people in our lives that have done something that we wonder, why do they hate us? What do they have against us? But Jesus didn't pull any punches. He said, here's how you deal with it. Bless those that curse you. Pray for them. Yes. You know, love your enemies. Be good to people that despise you. That's how you deal with it. That's what the Lord told us, the way that we have to live. And we've got to get this down, what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not saying sorry or ignoring the person. That's not forgiveness. But it's, I find it very strange that as human beings, we have this tendency to hang on to the very things that hurt us the most. We just keep hanging it on and bringing it back, having it bottled up, having it come up again and again and again and again. And you know what? That's not hurting the other person. Amen. But it's tearing us up. Yes. Yes. Jesus refused to do that. Can you imagine? Here's God. God manifests in the flesh. Can you, can you imagine him doing anything but good? He did everything he could. You know, he was a street minister. He was out there preaching all the time. He healed people. He blessed people. He loved children. But here comes the religious leaders, the Pharisees. What do they do? They want to put him to trial. Right. And it wasn't just the Pharisees. Let's not think, oh, it's just some religious muckety-mucks. There's other people that were involved in this. But they're finally able to orchestrate his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. They're finally able to get this where he's going to go on the cross now here's God, here's God manifest in the flesh, hanging on the cross, hanging in agony. But here's what he says in Luke 23 and 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Well, I'm sorry. They knew exactly what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They knew they were crucifying him. But what Jesus meant was they don't understand they don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand that they were acting out of sin. Yes. Yeah. And they, they don't understand and accept that they were crucifying the Son of God. Right. God manifest in flesh. And they certainly did not understand that they were enacting the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. They did not know that. So that's what they didn't understand. But Jesus gave us this principle throughout his ministry that we have to let go of offenses. Can you imagine being on a cross, being crucified, and saying, forgive them? Amen. That's what our Lord and Savior did. He said, forgive them. Amen. And he's forgiven us plenty. Yes. But we have this, these things called feelings. <laughs> and trying to control our feelings becomes very difficult. Feelings seem to sneak up on us just at the worst time. You know, they come rushing to the surface. So how, how do you forgive when you can't control your feelings? The only way that we can do that is we have to make a choice. Right. And I want to give you an idea when you're in some of these situations of how you can make that choice. So, a little exercise here. So, I want in your mind that you start to make a list of everything that you did against God 
that got you in trouble any time in your life. Put all those things in there, things that, sins that separated you from a holy Savior, from a holy God. And then admit you, you were an unlovable sinner. There really wasn't a reason for God to forgive you. But you know, he wiped out every one of those wrongs yes. that you had and your family had. He gave you a hope of attaining eternity and spending it yes. with him. He gave us that hope. God yes. did that for us. Amen. Then I want you to take a few moments and think about anything anyone may have done to you. But what I want to tell you is any of those things that anyone did to you, whether you live another 10 minutes, 10 years, or 50 years, when you're gone, those are all gone. Right. They don't matter. They're all gone. But I'm telling you, if Christ hadn't forgiven you, the other list, if Christ had not forgiven you, you would have all the eternity to suffer. And that's that's a loving God. That's a God that loves us. So, since we've forgiven, been forgiven so much, when we look at how much God's forgiven us, how can we not forgive somebody? No matter what they've done, how can we not? We have got to deal with it. There's people that think that what church is, you come and listen to so sermons, you, you, you sing some songs that make us feel good, but I'm telling you that I believe Jesus Christ wants us wants his church to come together, have his presence move us, and his word is taught or preached, and that we deal with the real issues of life. Yes. Not this fluff and being afraid to confront the things that we should confront. Amen. And that's what, that's what we've got to get to. But that, that's the big one. We have, to, we have to face that. Everything else is a distant second. You know? So what did Jesus say to do with your offenses? He said... Leave them go. Let them go. Don't hold on to them. But we're so stubborn. Yes. We want to let go of, do everything except let go of the hurt. It's kind of like, that's my pain. I want to keep that pain. You know, we'll hold on to that pain. We'll be unforgiving to the point of it can break up a marriage and a family. We're that stubborn. We can have where we don't talk to people because we're holding on to this pain. We're shunning them. That should not happen. Amen. Colossians 3 and 13, Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. So that's the point, as completely... As God, as you want God to forgive you your sins, you have to forgive. Yes. You can't hold on to that. You can't expect that God is going to forgive you in a different manner than you're forgiving. That's not scriptural. Right. Mm -hmm. The Bible is, remember the uh, acronym, B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Right. Right. It's God is telling us and he tells us I'm going to forgive you the way you forgive. Amen. So we've got to get that straight. We, you know, we've got to do it the right way. So we have to let go. Ephesians 4 and 32 says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So we had to be just like Joseph, where he wept. You know, wept unashamedly. He just let it all go. So, because we have to get to where we have that tenderness in our hearts, yes. where we have the ability that we can empathize with other people. And we can understand, even though we may not know everything they're going through, we have to be able to wrap our arms around them, give them a hug, let them know that we love them. So we have to let go. But what's on the other side of that letting go? What's on the other side of forgiveness? Let's look at what it was for Joseph. Genesis 45 and 8 says, So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he's made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So Joseph had come to grips with some things, and although his brothers, everything they wanted to do, you know the whole sequence of everything that they, they put him through, 
These things had to happen. Amen. These were things that molded Joseph. Yes. These are things that, all these little pieces, all these things that fell together in order for him to become the man that God wanted him to be. Right. So when you avoid some of these things and you don't confront them, you're probably not getting everything God wants you to get out of this. You know, man, I, I, I'm as guilty as this as anybody, but if something bad happens, I really don't say, well, okay, I'm in the pit. Can you send somebody now to sell me into slavery? I'm like, oh, Lord. Lord, get me out of here. Okay, I had enough. I learned. Come on, get me out of here. Amen. And, but, you know, we may be in the pit for a while. Mm -hmm. But some, we learn things many times through adversity, through the toughest things that happen in our lives. But there was God in the middle of all those circumstances orchestrating Joseph's life to where that dream that Joseph had as a very young man to where that could, where that could come true. Now you may say, well, Pastor, that's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. That's not my life. Well, Joseph didn't know. He was living that. He had no clue when this stuff was going to happen. But what he did say, but what he did have is trust and faith in his creator. He had faith that God was going to do what God needed to do in his life. And I, I, I got to believe sometime during that 14, 15 years of misery that Joseph was going through in his young life that, you know, I think he probably had a time or two where he said, okay, God, yeah, it's good, good. Get me out of here. That's enough. I, I, I'm, I'm good. Please get me out of here. So when you feel like that, it's not about beating yourself up. It, it's understanding that we have human feelings. But it's also saying that we have to do things uh, God's way. Yeah. Uh, so Joseph didn't really know everything that was happening to him there, but Joseph's family, the whole family gets to go live in the land of Goshen. Okay? So they're there, so now picture there's, and they were there for quite a while, so picture there's probably uh, kids and grandkids and great-grandkids and everything's going great and then Pop dies. Dad dies. Okay? So now the brothers are like, uh-oh, uh-oh, maybe Joseph, this was just an act. This was just an act, because I think they couldn't believe that Joseph could, could forgive him for these things. Maybe it was just an act, and now that, and they, he, was, he was being nice to us because dad's here, but now dad's gone, because if you read that account, they go before him, and they ask him what's going to happen, and Joseph it's like, wait a minute. You don't have to come and plead your case with me. I let go of this a long time ago. I was done with it. In Genesis 50 and 19, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? So Joseph's saying, it's not up to me. And what you meant for bad, God turned for good. That next verse I just love, and that is uh, verse 20 where it says, but as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. So he's going, my dream's coming true. I'm going to be helping all these people. You meant it for bad. But God can change that. So when you think about it, that something that was so bad, what these brothers did, so evil, so horrible, so contemptible, yet God can reach in the middle of a situation like that and he can pull something miraculous out of it. Right. He can pull out a young man that's going to end up <coughs> second in command in Egypt. Uh -huh. So why do we think God can't take care of our little Amen. problem? Amen. You know? This makes it a little clearer. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. It's at the end of the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
That's how God says we're going to be forgiven. I would think that would get a little bit of conviction in each one of us. I know it gets my heart a little aflutter. That <laughs> I got some work to do tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so forgiveness is important. You know, when Jesus came to the earth, that's the whole reason why. I think he wanted that promise of Matthew 6.14. Now I'm going to wrap this up in a minute or two here. But one of the things I want to say, I believe very strongly that there's people here tonight that the person that they need to forgive, you need to forgive yourself. Yes. Yes. That's good. You know, I think people, you know, have a conversation with yourself. That's right. Because there may, I, I feel very strongly that there's people that have fallen or failed and they're unable to forgive themselves and they keep beating themselves up over it. So it's just as critical to forgive ourselves as it is to forgive others. So if I could give you a gift for Christmas, all you want for Christmas, is I'd like to give you the ability to focus on the good things that you have. Take a look at all those things that you have to be thankful for that you should be grateful for, that you should be saying, thank you, Lord. Don't concentrate on the things that, are, that aren't good. You know, and forgive yourself. Amen. You know, but people tend to look at others and they see somebody else prays and their kids are coming to church and my kids aren't or my kids aren't living the right life or somebody else is getting promotions and I'm not. You take a look at your life, I will guarantee you, if you really take a look and you value the right things when you're looking, you'll find out you have a lot. Amen. God has Amen. blessed us Amen. tremendously. But I will tell you that things like, you know, you've had enough, you have enough health to get here tonight. Right. Thank you, Jesus. That's, that's a, quite a blessing. Yes. You were standing during the song service. Mm -hmm. That's quite a blessing. Amen. Lifting your hands. And you should be lifting your hands in those trials too when things are going bad that you should be like Joseph saying, thank you, Lord. I don't know exactly where you're taking this, but I do know that you can do anything and I know you have good in mind for me. Yes. And I want to yes. praise you for that. Yes. So, and don't spend, last thing, don't spend your life looking in the rearview mirror. Right. Okay? Philippians in the third chapter, it talks about, it says, I do not count myself to have attained or am already perfected. But this is the one thing I do. So I'm telling you one thing that you should do is you need to be thankful. Yes. You need to be forgiving. You need to do one nice thing. Do one. If you can do one, I will guarantee you God will find a way to have you be able to do another one. Yes. And another one. Yes. Yes. But you got to get that first one. And every day that's the type of things that we should be looking at, that we should be gathering together. When we come here, we need to be, we need to be helping each other and helping each other throughout the week. Yes. You know, God was very straightforward. Yes. He didn't try to hide things. He didn't try to make things, people look perfect, his church look perfect. I may burst your bubble now, but this is not a perfect church. <laughs> this isn't it. It's not perfect. And we have to know that we're all different and we're going to come together and we're going to, you know what? There's going to be time offenses will come. There's going to be times that we anger each other. But we've got to let it go. We've got to get over it and say, it's okay. I'm not God. I can't judge. You're not God. You can't judge. We have to say we love each other. And... There's one person after another that failed in the Bible. But I am going to tell you something about the way people judge. And this is a little, bit of a, a little bit of a Christmas message. I don't know what exactly Pastor Dave's going to do next week, so I don't want to steal anything. But I will say in Matthew, in the first chapter, in the 21st verse, it says, and she shall bring forth a son. Well, that she was Mary, was a teenage girl, unmarried, and pregnant. And now, everyone around her looked at her badly. 
looked at her. They didn't understand that that was the Holy Spirit. That was God that impregnated her. But that's how people looked at her. And so she was kind of an outcast by society then at that time. But she, but she was the one that brought forth the Savior. And it goes on to say, And you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. Verses 22 and 23 say, All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Don't ever take that for granted or think that's a tagline, God with, God with us. That is an incredible blessing. Yes. Yes. That is so powerful. Don't get used to that. Don't take it for granted. But God with us. And this time of year is when you hear Emmanuel more than often because I think this is in the Charlie Brown Christmas and you know, shows, shows like that. So, uh, But God tells us a couple things. He, to wrap up, he wants two things, he said, for us to do. I want you to forgive everyone else. I don't care who wronged you. I want you to let it go. Let it go. And then he says, I want you to forgive yourself. I believe those are the two things. He said, but because it's who are you to not forgive yourself when I forgave you? That's right. So God has forgiven each and every one of us, and we have to accept that. But I want to open up this altar, and I would strongly suggest that you take advantage of the time to pray. There's family members here, there's friends, but that you pray. If you have to leave, you may, you can. It's a, you know, we're free moral agents. We can do whatever we want. But I'd strongly suggest that you take some time with God. And think about what we've talked about, about forgiving yourself, forgiving others. Uh, and please, as you're going through not only this Christmas season, but afterward too, but now the days that we have ahead and you see people rushing around and probably giving you signs, hand signs from their car that they're upset with you or just let it go. Let it, let it go and enjoy the day and know that you have a Savior that loves you. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right, this altar is open.